for electing to spend part of this November 4th with CNN Student News. From the CNN Center, I'm Carl Azus. After decades of broken politics in Washington, eight years of failed policies from George W. Bush, 21 months of a campaign that's taken us from the rocky coast of Maine to the sunshine of California, we are one day away from changing the United States of America. I've been fighting for this country since I was 17 years old, and I have the scars to prove it. And if I'm elected president, I'll fight to shake up Washington. And we'll take America in a new direction. We'll take America in a new direction from my first day in office until my last I'm not afraid of the fight. I'm ready for it. There you have it. Senators Barack Obama and John McCain making their final arguments to the American public on the eve of the election. Monday also brought sad news for Senator Obama, who announced that his grandmother passed away from cancer. Senator McCain offered condolences to his opponent. Now, today, of course, is Election Day, when voters cast their ballots for candidates running for the presidency and all sorts of federal and local office. By law, this always falls on a Tuesday. Why? Ed LaVandera examines the answer. Voting on a Tuesday is a tradition that started more than 150 years ago. Back to the days when it was something like this that actually took people to the voting booths. In the 1840s, America was mostly a farming society, so Election Day was set up on the first Tuesday in November. The thinking was the harvest was over, people would go to church on Sundays, Monday would be a travel day to the polls, they'd vote on Tuesday and then ride home Wednesday. To New York Congressman Steve Israel, it all seems so old-fashioned. It's crazy to me that uh, we are only allowing people to vote over a certain period of hours on one day. Most nations that have much higher voter turnout allow their people to vote over several days. So Israel is sponsoring legislation that would make elections a two-day weekend event in November. Of course, 31 states already have early voting, but 19 states don't. Ask your friends if they know why we vote on a Tuesday. It's the million-dollar stump question. Do you have any idea why we vote on Tuesday? <laughs> uh, wait a minute. Mr. Dunn says, I'm sorry, I don't know the answer to that question, sir. <laughs> I'm Congressman Steve Israel from New York. Even the congressman walked around Capitol Hill asking the same question. The video was posted on YouTube by a group called WhyTuesday.org. Why do you think we have Election Day on Tuesdays in America? Why do we have Election Days on Tuesdays? I guess because once upon a time all the taverns were closed on Tuesdays. Of course, not everyone likes the idea of moving Election Day. Some say it would mess up tradition, confuse voters, and possibly make elections more costly. Now, Congressman Israel says that making the election a weekend event would increase voter turnout. And even though great turnout is expected on Tuesday, tens of millions of people still won't be voting. Maybe it's because their horse broke down. Ed Lavendera, CNN, Dallas. Okay, now for everyone who can saddle up to the voting booth, here's how today works. You, your parents, your friends, you cast a ballot for an elector, not directly a presidential candidate. Each state has a certain number of electoral votes based on how many people live there. There are 538 total electors. It takes 270 to win. The Electoral College 101 video on our website gives you the full scoop. And while you're there, use our electoral map calculator to track how the election is unfolding as the votes come in. A word to the wise. Deficit. The amount of money by which a company or government's spending is more than its income. Right now, the U.S. government is running a deficit of more than $450 billion. That is the highest it has ever been. The status of the country's economy has changed a lot since Senators McCain and Obama started running for president. Christine Romans examines how recent financial struggles could impact some of the candidates' plans for the economy. 
Promises, promises. To hold the line on taxes. No tax. Health care. Universal health care. Cut the capital gains tax. We'll eliminate capital gains taxes. If the next president keeps his promises, he'll blow an even bigger hole in the country's already shaky finances. Either one of them would have to scale back on some of the promises that they're making now. Either uh, McCain would have to give up on some of his tax cut proposals or Obama would have to give up on some of his uh, major spending initiatives. Why? The government is already spending dramatically more money than it takes in. $454 billion more in fiscal 2008, and that's before the federal government's bailout of Wall Street and major banks. The next president inherits a budget deficit next year forecast to exceed $700 billion. And you don't hear much on the trail about the staggering national debt. The national debt now tops $10 trillion. Think of it. That's the money the government has already spent that it doesn't have. That's real money. And taxpayers are on the hook for it. The job they're inheriting in January is very different than the job that they initially signed up for because of the financial meltdown. A meltdown still unfolding, yet both candidates stick by their ambitious campaign promises. On a campaign trail, uh, the goal of candidates is to promise lots of goodies but not talk about the pains. Many budget experts agree this is hardly the time for hand wringing about the country's record debts. This financial crisis so severe, deficit spending is critical for the short run. Christine Romans, CNN, New York. And the financial crisis, not over. A prime example, Circuit City is shutting down 155 of its U.S. locations by the end of the year, and it's laying off thousands of employees. The electronics giant made the announcement yesterday, saying it's taking this action for the future of the company. Closing sales are expected to start tomorrow at the stores that are shutting down. And a tragic resolution to the disappearance of Steve Fawcett, who you see in this file video. Authorities have discovered and identified the remains of the millionaire adventurer, which were found near the wreckage of his plane near Mammoth Lakes, California. Fawcett was known for his record-setting round-the-world travel. He disappeared in September of last year after taking off on a flight from Nevada. Time for the shout-out. What country did Labrador Retrievers originally come from? If you think you know it, shout it out. Is it the United States, France, the United Kingdom, or Canada? You've got three seconds. Go. These canines originally came from Newfoundland, Canada. That's your answer, and that's your shout out. According to the American Kennel Club, labs are popular dogs partly because they're easy to train. That is why a Florida police officer recently adopted one, but not as a pet. Melissa Sagigian of Bay News 9 in Polk County tells us about a pound puppy that's out on patrol. When Jazzy and Sergio Negrin decided to get a new dog, they knew they wanted to rescue one. I would take all these dogs home if I could. <laughs> Detective J.D. Maney also came searching the cages a few months back. He wasn't looking for a pet. He needed a new partner. His boss said the sheriff's office didn't have $5,000 to buy a new canine. The money wasn't available, but he said if I wanted to find a dog that could be donated and I could train it, he said, have it. So Maney came to the Polk County Animal Shelter and tested several dogs for alertness and lack of fear. He finally found a lab mix that passed his tests with confidence. Everything you could think of is the dog afraid to do it. And he had no problem with all of it. Maney adopted the dog and named him Residue. He spent the next 12 weeks teaching him how to sniff out drugs from cars, buildings, and boxes. He surprised me. Residue has come a long way since his days here at the shelter in August. He earned national certification through the North American Police Work Dog Association. They started working the streets as a team last month. Residue came down the van. He stopped, went up, sniffed the handle, and sat, which is how, you know, the non-aggressive alert we train him for. And I opened it up, and right there by the seat was a big piece of rock cocaine. Sheriff's officials now call Residue a valued member of the agency. They say Maney saved a life while saving them money. Then a green say they hope the puppy they decided to take home becomes just as important to them. You never know what you get, you know, it's like a surprise on Christmas. And that puts the leash on today's show. We'll see you again tomorrow. Have a great day.